All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so before I introduce today's speaker, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, let me mention that uh, uh, a recording of uh, last week's lecture by Tatiana Nibida uh, so, uh, is available. Uh, a link to a YouTube video of that talk is available at the website of the New York Group Series Seminar. And I'll post a recording of today's talk uh, no, hopefully no. later tonight. I um, also wanted to mention that uh, today after the talk, uh, so you don't have to disappear right away, we'll keep the uh, Zoom session open for a little while so that people can talk to each other for at least for a few minutes. Uh, so uh, you don't have to quit immediately. Uh, so we'll try to have a, a slightly more extended informal chat for those who want to. So uh, with that said, uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker uh, in the New York Group Series Seminar. It's uh, Frank Wagner from uh, Vanderbilt University. He's, he's going to tell us something about torsion subgroups of groups with cubic brain function. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, very happy to be able to present in these uh, strange circumstances. Um, so uh, I'm going to first talk a little bit of background about den functions, and then I'll talk about the answer the questions that I'm look the question I've been looking at and how and kind of outline how I am approaching things. So first of all, we look at some presentation of a group. Uh, then if we take some word over the generators, it's equal to one in the group if it's in the normal closure of the relations. Uh, so of course we know this, but uh, what what we want to say here is that this means that we can write it freely as some product of k conjugates of relations or their inverses. And this minimal, the minimal k for which there is such a, uh, such a representation, I'm going to call the area of this word uh, in this presentation. Clearly, this is very, uh, very unique to this presentation. Um, you know, depends on what presentation we're looking at. Uh, if our presentation is finite, then we define the den function as some function that takes in a natural number and tells us the maximum area of a word which represents the identity inside we can think of it in terms of the uh, n ball in the Cayley graph with generators x. Um, there's a more showing up here. Oh gotcha. All right um, so we define this den function uh, we take it up to an equivalence which we define by this pre-order that we put on all functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers uh, to say that some function precedes another function if and only if uh, we're going to say that it's basically coarsely below, f is coarsely bounded above by g up to uh, some linear term. Okay, uh, It's easy to see that if we have two finite presentations of the same group, then their den functions are going to be equivalent up to this equivalence that we establish. So that allows us to, um, instead of talking about the den function of specific presentations of a group, just talk about the den function of this finitely presented group. All right, so a couple basic examples. Uh, if our group is free, then its den function is linear. Uh, this might seem counterintuitive at first because, well, if we take any reduced word or it's it's not going oh in the free group it's not going to be trivial so the uh area the den function should just be the constant zero function uh but we're coarsely up to some linear term so we're just going to say that it's linear uh for z squared uh it's quadratic den function uh an easy example to see this is if we take the natural presentation of z squared with our um, nice commutator there, and we look at the n by n square in this, then this area is going to be n squared, whereas the input, the length of this word, is uh, linear in terms of n. Uh, now, this diagram helps us see that this area is n squared. It's not 100% obvious right off the bat, but you can convince yourself that in order to trace out this uh, word here, which is the word we are looking for the area of, I'm going to need to go around each little square at least once. So the area should be at least n squared and then exhibiting exactly one relation 
one decomposition in terms of the commutator will give you that it's actually equal to n squared. Okay. And just one more example, uh, we look at the bombs log solitar group, ES12. Uh, its den function is going to be exponential. Uh, here, if we take the natural presentation of von Svelik Solitar group, and we look at this uh, this guy here, <laughs> which is a relation, basically an easy way of looking at this is looking at this diagram here and saying, well, we're conjugating b by a to the n. This will give us b to the 2 to the n. Uh, then if we just conjugate b inverse by a to the n, we're going to get b to the negative 2 to the n. Uh, okay, now if we just offset these by 1, we can prove that this would be similar to the other situation where we need to go around each, each cell at least once, and the area of this diagram is something in terms of 2 to the n. All right, so there's some tool I'm using here that I'm not talking about, I'm kind of waving my hands at, which is Van Kampen diagrams. So let's talk about these a little more uh, specifically. So a Van Kampen diagram is a finite planar two complex with some orientation uh, and also equipped with a labeling function, which will label each edge uh, by some element of the generating set um, and then also label each two cell by some relation or a relations inverse. So basically exactly what we're looking at over here, where this cell right here will be labeled by the relation that we're used to. I mean, A, B, A inverse, B to the negative two. Whereas here, if we look at the bottom, say, then we're gonna have A, B inverse, A inverse is B squared. So we just have the exact opposite, like the inverse of our relation. Okay, and then Van Kampen's lemma uh, states that a word in our generators that should be over x uh, is equal to one in our group uh, if and only if we have such a diagram with boundary uh, boundary label equal to this word. Okay, uh, the area of our diagram is just going to be the number of two cells it contains, similar to I kind of already said area at one point. Um, and a minimal Van Kampen diagram is one with minimal area in terms of no other diagram has the same boundary label and smaller area. Okay, so a useful note just to notice here is just based on definitions, it's pretty clear that if delta is minimal, then its area is the area in combinatorially of the uh, label, uh, that should be label, of the boundary in over the presentation that this diagram is taken over. So what this allows us to do is look at, um, look at algorithmic questions with topology, two-dimensional topology and graph theory, approach things in different ways, and also use facts we know from other areas and apply them to these algorithmic questions, specifically about the den function, since now we can express the den function as this geometric property of these diagrams. Uh, so uses where we can see this, uh, many people are, will, will know right away, a small cancellation theory, uh, we have den's algorithm and Greenlinger cells. Basically what we're looking at here is we can if we have some nice small cancellation conditions on our group, we can find some cell that's basically poking out of the diagram in that it shares its boundary with the boundary of the diagram. And the part that's shared is almost is more than half of the whole cell. That answer can be used to uh, apply lots of inductive proofs and answer lots of things about small cancellation. Um, now, graded small cancellation is a uh, tool that we use for studying certain groups. I'm going to kind of wave my hands in terms of what it is, similar to what I, you know, I didn't say what small cancellation was. But graded small cancellation, I'm just going to say that instead of he, this situation where the cell is actually poking out of the diagram and sharing its boundary with the boundary of the diagram, here I'm looking at its 
its boundary is close to the boundary of the diagram. You can think of this in terms of any cells in between its boundary and the boundary of the diagram are smaller than the cell itself, right? In some sense, we can think of it in terms of it's the perimeters of these cells in between will be much smaller. We'll talk about how how that can be used. Um, so why do we care about den functions? Well, a finitely presented group has solvable word problem if and only if the uh, den function is bounded above some by some recursive function based on the order that we pre-order we put on these functions. Uh, and in general, the smaller your den function, the easier the word problem is to solve. That's just a general fact that you can kind of use and think about when in terms of studying these den functions. Um, if M is a compact Ramanian manifold, then its fundamental group, its den function is equivalent to the smallest isoparametric function of the universal cover of this manifold. That helps us like see some geometric ideas for why we might care about the den function. And the den function also gives us another characterization of hyperbolicity in that a group is hyperbolic if and only if it's finitely presented and has den function linear. Okay. So some just basic notes about the den function. We already saw this when I talked about the um, when I talked about the free group. Uh, den functions are all um, bounded below by the linear function. Right? We can always say that it's at least as big as the linear function because even constants are at least as big as the linear function. Um, any two polynomials of the same degree are equivalent up to this equivalence that's you know pretty clear and so that allows us to instead of talking about a group with den function 5n squared plus 3n we can just talk about groups with quadratic den function, cubic den function, etc. Um, and then this isoparametric gap says that uh, that Gromov established says that uh, if your den function is below quadratic, then it has to be hyperbolic. Meaning that there's uh, this jump between den functions of uh, that are n and den functions that are n squared, and no such jump happens later. So that begs a question that we can uh, ask ourselves, which is what properties of hyperbolic groups, we know lots of nice properties that uh, we like about hyperbolic groups. Uh, we want to know if any of them or are or are not carried over to finitely presented groups with quadratic den function, cubic den function, small den function, just whatever you want to say. Right? So an example of a question that arises like this is Gromov proved in the late 80s that hyperbolic groups have solvable conjugacy problem. Uh, so off the bat, you might say, well, wait, uh, what about next rung up? Uh, and 30 years later, Olshansky and Sapir proved uh, they exhibited a finitely presented group with quadratic den function and unsolvable conjugacy problem. So this property, this next property of hyperbolic groups is not carried over. Okay. So, I want to answer a similar question with similar methods. So I'm going to try to talk about these question I'm going to want to talk about, which has to do with these Burnside varieties. So the Burnside variety for some natural number is the class of groups with that exponent. So if we just say B sub n, that's all groups that satisfy the group law x to the n equals 1. So everything, every word raised to the n is 1. As with any variety, these varieties have uh, free objects. I'm going to view these free objects and just, just for simplicity, say they're finitely generated uh, and say that, um, so the free Burnside group, B of MN, it's the group with this presentation, M generators, and just every word raised to the N is one. Okay. Um, so, Historically, the Burnside problem dates back further than this, but I'm just going to talk about the bounded Burnside problem, which asked us uh, asked whether or not there exist M and N for which B of MN is infinite. 
Um, so solution is 1968 by Novikov and Adian. They showed that for all n, at least some number, which was later improved by Adian, uh, then B of mn has to be infinite as long as it's not cyclic. And Olshansky provides a geometric proof of this. Uh, now it doesn't have the same bounds. The bounds are much worse in his proof, but his proof uses graded small cancellation theory. Um, now one consequence, of, on just one consequence of this graded small cancellation is something I want to touch upon, which is that if we go back and think about what small cancellation does for us using Den's algorithm, it shows us that the, uh, that the Den function of this of hyperbolic groups uh, can be expressed as, uh, as, as linear. It's, they all have linear den function. Well, here, since we're looking at graded small cancellation, and that's just kind of a generalization of small cancellation, you might want to expect something similar, something nice. So what I ended up proving here was that if you just take the squares of the perimeters of each of the cells, then that's going to be bounded by the quadra a quadratic function of the cells. Now that can be improved quite a bit. That these quadratic can be improved quite a bit, but this is a fact about B of M N that's useful and something that uh, I will come back to in terms of how we might generalize this situation. Okay, so I'm just going to keep that in mind. All right, so. I'm talking about den functions. I'm talking about free Burnside groups. There's no, there, there seems to be a big gap coming up here, which is that these free Burnside groups are not finitely presented. So I can't speak about their den functions at all. In fact, I, what a, any in we don't know of any infinite torsion, finitely generated infinite torsion group which can be finitely presented. So, what, what questions could we ask about this? Um, so general problem that I might you might want to know is well if we have a finitely presented group and it contains an infinite torsion subgroup uh, which is finitely generated can we say anything about its uh, den function um, one result towards uh, this uh, sorry yes mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think we got shook. Maybe somebody else. I remember they consider maybe with Ivanov uh, uh, consider this question. It is possible to talk about the den function for a presentation, even if the presentation is infinite, as long as the generating set is finite, right? Right. Yes. Like there is, there is to it, uh, uh, but uh, is anything known about? Uh, well, okay. I think that there were several versions of what the den function might mean in that uh, context. But is it known what it is for free bound side groups uh, for for the standard presentations of them? Um, so I know that the word problem is solvable in like basically linear time. Uh, so I think that I'm, I'm not sure of the... Uh, yeah, I, I think in their paper they consider the case of uh, free Burnside group. And do, do you remember what they prove? Uh, uh, not I, exactly. I remember that it was poly, polynomially bounded, uh, mm -hmm. but either it was quadratic or maybe even linear for some presentations. Of course, it also depends on the presentation, right? So when uh, yeah, I'm talking about the standard presentation. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. It was that. polynomial. That's what it I remember. Polynomial. Yeah, I was wondering was it actually linear, but okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, so we want to answer. We will want to consider this problem. Uh, so Gies and De La Harp uh, showed that in 1990 showed that if a group is hyperbolic and it has a torsion subgroup, then that torsion subgroup has to be finite itself. So right off the bat, we know one thing, which is that the den function needs to be at least quadratic of our finitely presented group. Um, the best result since then uh, it was 10 years later, Olshansky and Sapir uh, exhibited a finitely presented group uh, with a finitely generated infinite torsion subgroup, and its den function was at most uh, n to the 10. So that's where my theorem, uh, our theorem comes in, which is that uh, we exhibit a group which is finitely presented, has a finitely generated infinite torsion subgroup, and has at most cubic den function. And you can just make it cubic den function. Uh, you can just say it's equivalent by just crossing it with the Heisenberg group, say. All right. Um, and then moreover, for all 
large odd n here large means like 10 to the 10th say um then there exists such a a group g sub n where b of m n embeds into g sub n for all n okay so i'm now gonna shift gears and kind of talk about the tools i use to answer this question and um kind of give a rough outline of why we, how we might generalize this and how we might uh, care about improving this problem, this solution, I should say. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is S machines. Um, S machines, we're just gonna think of them as rewriting systems and also H and N extensions of a free group. Keep that in mind as I kind of talk about this uh, general definition of what they are. So we start off with these two sets, Q and Y. Everything is finite in them. You can think of these sets as being non-empty, say. Each one is broken into a bunch of uh, subsets that we can take disjoint union over. OK, so I want to define an admissible word over this language, a word that basically we are going to say is, is, is nuts. Right, so it's Q zero to blah blah blah. blah. Uh, each of these Q letters, we're going to think of it as some element coming from one of these Qs, and these are words over the alphabets of the Y sub I's. Okay, now they don't need to actually match up in terms of their indexing. So what I'm going to do to just explain how they work is just talk about how. I'm just going to rewrite this top part, Q0, Y1, Q1, Y2, so put them in some order and kind of break down the three cases of what they could be and then give a nice little drawing for how we can think about them. So if we wanted to think about how what QK minus 1, WK minus 1, QK could be, well, I could pick some element from Q0, follow it up by a word over the alphabet Y1, and then pick some element from Q1. Or if I can, if I want to move to the left, I can have some element from Q1 inverse, some word over Y1, and then some element from Q0 inverse. Okay. I could also have Q, uh, Q, W, Q inverse. So I could just look at some element from Q0, followed by a word from Y1 and then back to the same element, but it's inverse in Q0. I have a question. So it is deterministic or not necessarily? It is non-deterministic, yeah. Okay. And then the final situation is just basically the inverse of that. You take an element from Q1 inverse, a word over Y1, and then an element from Q1. Okay, now there's, I, I've kind of glossed over one indexing quirk here, which is that, well, I could have also had an element from Q0 inverse, and then these should be kind of connected. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and then I have a word over Yn plus one, and then back to Q0. So the way I like to think about this is written on a circle like this, um, where if we're going around clockwise, we're looking at the uh, pot the positive versions of these letters and then we can kind of turn around on the blue edges so we can have an element from q0 followed by a word from y1 followed by an element from q1 followed by a word over y2 and then go back and now that we're going counterclockwise have an element from q1 inverse and so on So an S rule is some rewriting rule that we're going to look at. Now, just to make things simple, I'm going to just say that it's of this form where we have some Q0, and we're going to say it turns it into uh, a letter times Q0 prime times a letter. Uh, now, these should be from the right uh, alphabets, but we can worry about that in a second. And then we also assign some domain to theta to this rule, which is to say that we look at, we just take some subset of Y and this Q, th Q of theta is just all the letters from the left sides of these arrows 
in this rule. Okay. And then we want to understand how this rewrites these words. Well, what it does is it checks to make sure all the letters from our admissible word are from the right domain. Everything needs to be in the domain of theta or its inverse. Then it replaces anything that shows up on the left with whatever shows up on the right or inverses in W. And then the last step is that it makes any necessary reductions or trims to make the resulting word again admissible. Now I said that it was the last step, but really these are all one step. You gotta kind of think of these as being all together, right? Reduction is not its own step in here to make the time functions work out nicely. Okay, so simple example, just to see what I'm talking about. If we take n to be two, right? And we define our rule to be q0 goes to q0 prime and what's written here. And say we just take the domain of theta in the y's to just be the whole alphabet so that we don't need to worry about anything. Um, now we take this word, q0, q1, a, b, q1 inverse, v, let's just say v is some non-empty word in the right alphabet, and then q1. So now w, we need to, theta needs to check that everything's in the right alphabet. Well, all the y letters are fine because that's everything's in the right alphabet. Um, and then everything I had given it was on the left side of the actual writing of the rule. So now we just turn everything into what it, it, it's on the right side. So Q0 turns into Q0 prime, Q1 turns into Q1 prime A inverse, and so on. Okay, but there's two issues. One small issue is this A inverse A, we have some non unreduced part of this, and that needs to cancel with each other. Okay, that they will. Uh, but there's one more problem, which is that at the very end, we have this extra A inverse at the end. And so what we're going to do is just kind of ignore that. We kind of trim that guy off. We make the reduction. And now we end up at a, a new admissible word. So then an S machine is going to be this triple where we have Y and Q and a bunch of S rules on Y and Q, uh, which is some symmetric set, right? Which we break down as the disjoint union of the positive rules and the negative rules where they, we just randomly pick which ones are positive, which one, and their inverses should be negative. Okay. And then a computation in this is going to be some sequence of application, as you would expect. OK, so how does this relate to groups? And how am I going to use this? Well, if we look at, if we just take r to be uh, the positive rules indexed from 0 to n, where n is the number of subsets of, well, I guess it's n plus 1 is the number of subsets of q. Um, that we take the disjoint union over, uh, then we're going to define this finitely presented group M of S as being generated, the group generated by Y, Q, and R, where R is really kind of think of them as all the thetas. And we give it two relations, uh, well, two types of relations, which is that um, the theta I's should, can, should uh, commute with the correct uh, letters from Y, meaning we want it to commute with the letters from the domain of theta that are in Y sub I, where I is the index of theta over here. And here we want to kind of uh, simulate the work that's being done by the S machine. So we're going to turn Q sub I into A sub I, Q sub I prime B sub I plus one, where these are as defined in the rule, uh, but theta i, we're not exactly conjugating here because we have theta i and then theta i plus one over here. So we're not quite conjugating, but we're just kind of 
changing which letter we we have. What that allows us to do is basically simulate the work of these S machines in terms of the fact that we force this letter to change. This makes any word that's written on the bottom of one of these diagrams that I'm going to look at in a second have to be admissible. So for example, in the example that we looked at before, we had Q0, Q1, AB, Q1 inverse, B, Q1. Uh, that's what's written along the bottom of this diagram. So this, but the bottom of this diagram is just labeled by W. And now I can kind of change it using thetas with the right uh, indexing uh, to turn Q0 into Q0 prime, turn Q1 into Q1 prime A inverse. Oh, but we want this cancellation to happen. So we also add this thing and kind of glue things up so the cancellation happened. So we're kind of having the cancellation in this, uh, in the diagram like that. And then we kind of continue down the line. Now the only problem is this A inverse doesn't really go away. So we don't quite get what we were looking at, what we were hoping for, I should say, uh, because we don't, we don't actually just trim off an edge. We can't just do that um, in terms of the diagram. So we kind of just push it off to the side, view it as like a rough corner on the diagram and worry about that later in terms of estimating things. But up to those edges that need to be neglected, um, oh, right, and I should maybe mention that this, I'm going to call this sort of diagram here a theta band. Similar to how we look at things in H and N extensions, uh, this looks like a band where across from each theta, we have these parallel theta i's going across, and that will just continue and make a nice band in our diagram. Uh, but that band could kind of loop around on itself uh, if we continued giving us what we would call a theta annulus, which I'll talk about in a second. So just based on what that looked, how that, that worked with our one example, we can kind of see that this group is going to simulate the work of our machines in that given some computation, W0 to WT, we can produce a nice diagram up to these little rough edges that might not, might or might not be there that kind of go W0, then W1 on the next level, then W2 up to WT on the last level with these rough edges, maybe. Okay. Now I already talked about theta bands where we can just have these across from each other are these theta edges. Uh, the same thing happens with Qs, right? If we have a uh, cell containing a Q, we have QI, okay, it turns into QI prime. There's these two things, but say this isn't on the boundary of the diagram, we're gonna need another cell attached at this edge. So maybe there's another cell like this, labeled exactly, sim well, not exactly, but similarly. Uh, and it will continue upward. Now, maybe it didn't exactly look like that. Maybe the C and the D were on the other side, but still we have this QI parallel to this QI prime, parallel to this QI double prime, and it'll continue. So we can kind of treat these like H and N extension diagram, diagrams over H and N extensions with these bands and kind of view things that way. Okay, so the last group, the group that I actually end up using the most here is this group G of S, which is the group we just defined, uh, but modded out by the normal closure of this one word, a fixed word that's admissible. It usually is just has uh, Q letters in a row, specific ones that I care about, and that will now be one. That's what I call the hub word. So this might seem a little uh, incorrect based on the trimming that goes that that uh, we've just defined, 
but the fact the fact that I uh, the way we define these things uh, the hub word if we just have any computation that ends at the hub word now that will also be equal to one in our group because we can just attach all of these trapezia to the side here that simulate this computation and change all of the letters into what the change the word into the word v okay. we get around the trimming with certain method with certain definitions of the s machine that we can uh define the s machine in specific ways to make sure that no trimming is necessary when in this specific situation okay so that means that our word that we can operate on and end up at the hub word is actually trivial over our group that we're looking at here. So a strategy, the strategy we're gonna use here is I'm just gonna add extra relations for every one of these and assign it artificial area. And what I mean by that is that if I have some sort of diagram, I can, I can now take, I can now take, oh wow. There. I can now take my group G of S to be exactly as it was defined before. So the natural presentation of G of S and then also um, give it these extra relations where V was anything that could have been, yeah, let's just say it that way. So I'm just now adjoining these extra relations and giving it some sort of artificial area. Now, where are these artificial areas coming from? They're coming from how big this diagram might be in terms of what, what V might be, All right? So I can just pick one specific diagram for each V and give it that area. Okay, now in, in the machine, that I construct throughout to, to create the embedding, I give one of the um, Ys the alphabet A1 through AM. And I figure out, a, uh, I construct the machine so that in, in one computation, you can start off with exact, with the word W to the N written in any, written in this sector, written in this right here, or with this a different computation, you can do the same exact things, but just have nothing written right there. The difference between these two uh, disk relations around the outside is only that this is only in this one place. This was W to the N here, and this was nothing now, which means that they differ by some W to the N. Now this occurs for all W, not just any W, but not just one specific one. I can do this where it happens for all W. So what that ends up giving us is that W to the N is one in this group because they diff these two things, which are one, each trivial, differ only by the insertion of this W to the N. So I can do better and now add even more relations to my group, which is the relations of the free Burnside group. Um, and I determine, I term these relations A relations and call them A cells and uh, give them some artificial area based on the diagram that would, that I can get for them, which would be just pasting this diagram and this diagram together. Okay, so two facts about these groups that I that I can establish uh, is that if I have some word equal to one over the group, even here what I mean over the presentation given by uh, it's no longer finite at all, but it's the presentation given by the generators, all the relations that we established before, the hub relation, 
all the disc relations and all these A relations. Um, any, I can find uh, a diagram with a minimal number of disks. Also, this diagram has to have no theta annulus. These are facts that definitely need proof, but they're, I'm just going to kind of take them for granted at the moment. Okay. So how can I prove the embedding here? I mean, here I, all I know is that definitely uh, every word that is trivial in the free Burnside group is trivial in the natural um, sense in this group. So there exists a homomorphism from the free Burnside group onto this group, maybe not onto, but, uh, but I don't know that it's embedding. So how can I use these two facts to establish uh, such an embedding occurs? Well, I still, I go back to what the S machine is and prove more things about the S machine, things that I can understand in terms of computation of say a Turing machine or just a rewriting system. I can kind of think about, here's what I end up doing. I look at these um, specific Q letters on the boundary of this diagram. I space them out evenly and uh, say I put L of them. L is gonna be just some number that is big, but it doesn't really matter too much. I think it needs to be at least six. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I space them out evenly. And I view, I look at the types of Q bands that can come off of these edges. Um, now the Q bands, they have to keep going, but they can just stop on the edge of a disc. They can also stop on the edge of a diagram, but they can also, but they stop, they can stop on the edge of a disc. So what if we're in this situation where we have two um, consecutive such bands? They co correspond to these letters. They start on one disk and on another. And it's the same pair of disks. Well, what I end up showing is that if these two, um, if, if there is no hub or disk in between them, so in this green sub diagram, there's just no hub whatsoever, then this diagram here corresponds pretty naturally to a computation of my S machine. So what I do is I have to um, alter the S machine in such a way so that anything that looks like this will also apply to the bound to, to let's draw it this way, will also apply around to this word around here. What I mean by that is I can build a, uh, I can have a computation that starts with this word and ends with this word. So it starts with this word, ends with this word. The reason why that would be useful is now I can build a trapezium with boundary label equal to the boundary label of this sub diagram, this entire sub diagram. So I can just kind of take this whole diagram here, pull it out and replace it with one trapezium, decreasing the number of disks. And so kind of contradicting anything that, uh, that we were talking about before where I was saying, in fact, one, there exists a diagram with a minimal number of disks. So immediately we know that there has to be at least one disk in between them. Okay, this seems like an inconsequential fact that is, might not be useful, but here's where I can use that. Um, so what I'm now gonna do is for any diagram which satisfies the minimal disk condition that I care about. Um, I can associate the, to this uh, a nice planar graph with one exterior vertex 
a bunch of interior vertices. Each of the interior vertices has degree at least L, or not at least L, actually equal to L. <laughs> its degree is L. Um, there is no two gone inside here in that, you know, if you have two of them just bounded like this, there has to be another uh, vertex in between them. And then anything that connects to the boundary, these edges correspond to those nice Q bands I was talking about before. Anything that, that goes to the boundary, I connect it to the exterior vertex. So a quick combinatorial argument shows that as long as this, um, this L, this degree of each interior vertex is at least six, then we have this sort of diagram. We have one disk where at least L minus three of those um, Q bands coming off of it need to end on the boundary. In fact, we know more. We know that this orange sub diagram here, none of them contain a disk. That's uh, more information that I need right this moment, but all that's basically saying is I have to have some vertex in here and this sort of drawing here where L minus three of them come off of it. Okay, so I claim that this basically uh, establishes my embedding and in fact it does. Here's how, if we say that we take some word which in this group is equal to one, and this word is over the generators for the free Burnside group that are kind of copies in there, um, then I can find a Van Kampen diagram whose label is exactly that and a minimal number of disks. Well, I already kind of said that with my fact, we're taking that for granted. Well, now I know that it has no disks because if it had a disk, then one of them needs to look like this and if it looks like this, then at least one of the edges on the boundary is labeled by a Q. And if it's labeled by a Q, then it's not equal to W. Okay, so it has no disks. Also, I know that it has no thetas anywhere in the middle. The reason I know that is because there are no theta annuli. Right? If I have this diagram that's labeled by W, and I have some edge in here with a theta on it, well, then I get some sort of theta band. That theta band can't end on the boundary for the same reasons. And so it needs to loop around on itself and make a theta annual, which I claim doesn't happen. Again, a fact that we're kind of brushing under the rug, but you kind of get the point. So now delta is only consists of A cells. Each of those A cells is labeled by W to the N for some W. And so right away, that tells us that this whole diagram is a diagram over the free Burnside group. And so the word is trivial in the free Burnside group. So we have an embed. For the quadratic part, um, I'm going to kind of uh, not say much. All I'm going to say is just the sort of things we might want to we might want to look at. Um, really, what you really need to look at is I didn't, I really didn't say anything about these artificial areas. So I need to figure out a way to force these artificial areas to be small, right? And the way to do that is to force all of these computations here to have minimal, uh, to have a small length and a small width. Now, what do I mean by length? I mean how long the the computation is, that's easy enough, but the width is how big any, uh, any intermediate uh, admissible word might be. Maybe this somewhere in the middle, you might get some big uh, word. Well, that's going to make this part of the diagram, say, turn into something looking like this, which you would not want because now I can't estimate how big, because this is part of V call it V prime. This is part, part of W, call it W prime. Now I can't estimate how big this, di this diagram is, how big this area is in terms of uh, V. Okay. 
but I want to. So I kind of have to mess with the S machine and define it in specific ways so that this sort of thing can't happen. Okay, so now I want to just talk about my future work, um, where this might go from here. So first of all, the clear first step is to improve this to uh, the optimal statement, which is to say, instead of cubic den function, I want to embed these free Burnside groups into groups with quadratic den function, which uh, should be possible. The only difference is the machine needs to have even more special properties that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I want to generalize this embedding. Uh, what properties did I use about the free Burnside group that were necessary to make this embedding possible? Well, I kind of brushed this one under the rug, but I can find a Turing machine uh, which produces the defining relations of B of MN uh, with time function bounded by some linear uh, function. You can imagine, like, you can definitely write a Turing machine that will produce w to the n for any w, and probably you can uh, imagine that it would have that it would do each w to the n in time bounded by some constant times the length of w. We need that specific thing to happen here because that's how I bound the width of those um, of those. Uh, the width and the length of those computations. Uh, the other thing I needed was that small cancellation property, uh, which was that the sum of the uh, squares of the perimeters of the cells was at most uh, some quadratic function of the perimeter of the whole diagram. Uh, I can rewrite this as, since f is linear in this in our situation, uh, that it was down that the sum of the perimeter times f of the perimeter is less than or equal to some quadratic of the perimeter of the whole diagram. Uh, so what I want to do is study the relationship between f and g. There should be a, an embedding, uh, similar a similar embedding for f for groups with f and associated f and g into a finitely presented group whose den function is at most g. Um, the only issue is, well, what interesting examples exist. Uh, that's what I'm trying to study at the moment as well. And the last thing I want to study is the distortion of the embedding. Right? At the moment, I just have this embedding. It's sending the free Burnside group into this next group, but how badly is it distorted in that group? All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. Let's a very interesting talk. So now, uh, I guess you can all unmute yourselves, and if there are any questions, please ask them now. Uh, Frank, uh, what about uh, preservation of the conjugacy problem of your embedding construction? Ah, yes. That's a good question too. I can throw that onto future work as well. Um, basically, I'm not sure of how, just how badly distorted the group is at all. So yes, the conjugacy problem is solvable uh, in free Burnside group. Uh, I'm not sure in this other group. So um, I'm actually interested in this, uh, inequality that you have in the middle of the slide, that basically the sum of the squares of the perimeters uh, of the cells in this diagram is less than or equal to some quadratic uh, uh, function in the boundary, at uh, length of the boundary, right? Mm -hmm. So what does this tell us about um, uh, the asymptomatic uh, properties of the diagram itself, if you, let's say, try to bound the number of two cells in it or the number of one cells in it by the perimeter? Uh, so we're looking at diagrams over the um, over free Brewer inside group. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that it. It's a, it says something, but I'm sort of not sure what. <laughs> right, right, right. Because we're the the square is kind of um, throwing it through a loop 
uh, because we're not quite counting the number of cells yeah. there are. Um, uh, so the reason I ask is that in the meantime, I looked up uh, uh, this paper of uh, Grigachuk and if, and Ivanov. Uh, so here is this. Uh, so this is uh, in GAFA in 2009, where they consider specifically asymptomatic functions for infinite presentations, uh, uh, but where the number of generators is finite. And what they prove is that for these three birth rate groups, once again, once the exponent is sufficiently big or something, uh, the uh, one of these asymptomatic functions is uh, slightly subquadratic. It's less than or equal than n to the power, what, what is it, Nine, 19 over 12, uh, which is less than 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, the asymptomatic function is where they count the number of one cells uh, in the diagram and bound that in front of the perimeter. And they also note, and I haven't quite understood, uh, that if you count the number of two cells or the number of zero cells in the diagram, you may get different answers. But um, yeah. Uh, so, I would be interested in trying to understand what this inequality that you wrote there implies about any of that, because it's gotcha. something, but I don't know what. <laughs> All right, okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question, uh, Frank. So, in the work of uh, Sapira Alshansky, so the, uh, its degree is 10, right? Yes. Is it like the same method? Uh, similar method. Uh, what they what they were what they didn't use uh, was any. Uh, I think they didn't use any A cells throughout, and so many of the estimates weren't uh, weren't weren't um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, optimal. They were they were at most end of the tenth, uh, and I think they probably uh, if they had messed with the machine a little more could have uh, brought that down a little. So you like you change the construction or you like optimize? Yes. You oh yes, the, the construction is different as well. Yes, mm -hmm. and also the methods of uh, estimation are also different. Uh -huh. All right. If there are no other questions, so let's thank Frank again. All right, uh, so thank you everybody. So now those people who want to leave right away, you know, are free to leave. Those people who still want to stay in chat, you know, can stay in chat. I'll stop recording so that uh, if you say something embarrassing now, it will not uh, go online. <laughs>